Well, I, I suppose it's rather appropriate to be talking about um, uh, what we're about to talk about, uh, which is, well, did you get the title? Bring in the clowns. <laughs> the forthcoming election. All I can tell, now, I, maybe I'm going to offend all of you here. I better start off by pointing out I'm British, right? So that, thank you, thank you, thank you. Therefore, I mean, I'm not terribly sure whether this whole general election idea is a good idea at all. I mean, honestly, should you have broken away? <laughs> have you considered this recently? And be honest, who would you prefer to have as your head of state? Queen Elizabeth II or Barack Obama? Oh, good. My fellow British citizens, I, will, I have now reclaimed you. Sorry. I, oh, thank you very much. It's very kind of you. I've now reclaimed you for Her Majesty the Queen, who is 90 this year. Nin Sorry? Uh, I'm not interested in the polls. They can't count. Um, uh, the polls, they want to go back to Poland anyway. So anyway, back to this. Uh, so we're talking about, uh, I was going to say we're talking about the Queen. Well, we are talking. We shouldn't be talking about the Queen. We're talking about the elections. And the phrase is, bring in the clowns. Do you know what that comes from? Yeah, there's a famous musical um, and a famous song, right? Um, and then, bring in the clowns, don't bother, they're here. And apparently, looking up the, the author of this song, what he meant was, when things are going wrong, you bring in the clowns, people laugh, and that's okie dokie. And I suppose it's appropriate, as it's Memorial Day, more, sorry, Memorial Day today, I bought an American flag. I went to Costco and I bought a very large American flag. And the reason I bought an American flag is because Memorial Day is important, isn't it? Now, if you live in, in Britain, we have our own version of Memorial Day and everybody wears a poppy, a little poppy flower in their lapel to remember all the people who died fighting Britain's wars. When I flew to Canada, the exact same thing. Of course, as a Jew, I wore a poppy in Canada as well. And in America, when America is recalling the past, then by definition, when you're talking about people have given their lives for this country, which is what Memorial Day is supposed is all about, then at that point we're talking about, well, during the Civil War in 1861, how many Americans died? Apart from the ones who lost limbs, any idea? How many Jews got the tower at Mount Sinai? That's how many Americans died in the American Civil War from 1861 to 1865. So over a half a million. It was, like, it was a massive thing. And, you know, of course, the First World War and the Second World War, etc. I think it's appropriate for Jews to show that they are, we respect, we honor the memories of people that have passed away. But that's looking at the past. But when you're talking about a new president, you're looking towards the future. And uh, you have three candidates. Now, not, I, I don't care which way you vote. You're perfectly entitled to vote any kind of way you want. And I want to make a, a statement which I really believe. They all have a point. They all, most people have a point. Whether you agree with everything they say, but I think most people have a point. If I was an American, I suppose I'll have to become one. Uh, if I was an American, then I would be to the right of the uh, Democratic Party, or the left of the Republican Party. I would be, as the Rambam says, right in the middle, which is a nice place to be. And But most people have a point. I suppose Bernie Sanders has a point. Uh, Hillary Clinton has a point. <laughs> and, <laughs> and then there's that other guy. Uh, what's, he, what's he called? Uh, Donald Trump, whose mother is Scottish. Uh-huh. So he can't be that bad. So Donald Trump, I mean, I certainly has a point when he says there should be a wall between America and Mexico to keep out illegal immigrants. When I heard that, I immediately thought to myself, isn't there one? Isn't there one? When I became a permanent citizen of the United States of America, it cost a lot of money. And it took me a lot of time. And I had to have all sorts of police records and make sure that I was a good person, etc. Why didn't I just walk across the border if there's no border here? And I mean, what's, what's it all about? You don't have a border? I think he's got a point. So most people have, you can at least say they have a point. But we're looking at it from a Torah point of view, from a Jewish point of view. Apart from the fact, obviously, 
uh, none of the candidates here are, are standing on the basis of their allegiance to Torah and Halacha. However, <laughs> however, I think it's appropriate from a Jewish point of view to use Torah and Halacha, perhaps, to um, view whether or not this particular candidate or that particular candidate should attract somebody whose soul is, um, well, religiously Jewish. Does that make sense? So you probably know, I don't know if you ever see something called YouTube. You see YouTube? Somebody put up a video last, I think it was last week, and the video was, it was called 13 Minutes of Hillary Lying. 13 Minutes of Hillary Clinton Lying. And uh, this, as you'll know, is her big problem. The people who are critical of Hillary Clinton and incidentally being incredibly neutral. I'm only telling you what people say. Uh, but the people who are, are critical of Hillary Clinton point out that she has an enormous problem telling the truth. And this video simply went with piece, pieces of old footage of her saying one thing and then today denying that she ever said it. Right? For example, there is the famous story when she said she misspoke. That's an interesting word. Did they have that word before? I never heard that word. I misspoke. This is a bit like mistaken. I went into a department store. I put my hands in the cash register. And I walked out with the money. Oops, I mistook it, right? <laughs> so apparently misspeak is another way of saying I lied. So what happened was, you probably remember, she said she went to Bosnia the time of the breakup of the former Yugoslavia, they landed under heavy artillery fire. And they had to run from the aircraft on the tarmac to the armored vehicle to get them to safety. And then CNN, and it shows in this video, shows her getting off the plane. And there's a little girl with a bouquet of flowers. And she kisses the little girl, hands the bouquet. And then she goes and says hello to all the soldiers and talks to the soldiers and calmly gets into the vehicle, which drives her away. I was always against NAFTA, the North Atlantic Free Trade Association deal. And then the camera flips to the, the Hillary at the time. I think it's a great idea. right? And this 13 minutes of that, back and forth, back and forth. Her problem would seem to be, according to her critics, that she uh, has a problem with that word called the truth. Um, but I have to tell you, personally speaking, and from a terror point of view, I'm not terribly upset. You see, I expect my politicians to be liars. I expect all politicians to be liars. If anything, I just expect them to be better liars than that. You know, if, if the lie is so obvious and they expect you to believe the obvious lie, they're making a very simple statement about you. They believe, yes, <laughs> they believe that you are a profoundly stupid person. Now, this is actually an interesting idea because when Hillary, if you probably watch this on TV, I'm coming to the others in a second, just in case you're about to vote Hillary. Don't worry. I've got <laughs> a long way to go. Uh, the problem is that from a Torah point of view, and I was talking to a journalist recently. I, as you know, or you may know, I regularly broadcast in the BBC in England. I don't know if you knew that. I used to have my own shows, BBC, radio and TV. The BBC is hardly renowned for its neutrality, particularly when it comes to matters concerning Jews and the Middle East. However, I'll tell you something which is absolutely true. It would never happen in the BBC. But if you were having a, uh, a, 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 an interview with somebody on a political matter, whatever the political matter was, you'd only have one side. You'd only have the Republican there, but not the Democrat. You would only have the Democrat, not the Republican. That simply would not happen. So I was talking about this to a, a journalist here in America and saying that I've been astonished that so many TV shows, news shows, so many TV channels, and certainly the radio, like WNYC, which is one of the most incredibly biased uh, radio stations I've ever come across, again, particularly when it comes to Jews and particularly when it comes to Orthodox Jews. Uh, having said that, uh, in England, you would always have two sides to an argument. That's not what you get here. And he said, you know why? 
He said, because in America, people don't want to hear both sides of the argument. They want to have people saying what they already believe, just to reinforce what they already believe. From a Jewish point of view, does that make any sense? I'm a rabbi. All the time people come to tell me problems and to tell me stories. And I say, I'll listen. But until I hear both sides of the story, I'm coming to no conclusion whatsoever. After all, if somebody came to tell me a story about you, and you knew that I listened to the story and didn't seek your, your version of events, what would you think of me as a rabbi? What would you think of me as a human being? What would you think of a court system in which only the prosecution side was allowed to speak, but not the defense, or the other way about? Then it would be hopelessly biased against finding the truth. All, all in agreement? And they told me that CNN, which comes as a bit, big surprise, bearing in mind CNN's reputation when it comes to Israel, tries to do this. I didn't know this. I don't have a TV, so I only dip in now and again. But apparently they do have both sides. And, he's, and he told me, this journalist, that's why their ratings are falling. Because Americans don't want to hear both sides. They just want to hear one side. Now, so therefore, we go back to Hillary. What you get is like this. Hillary says things which clearly there is video evidence that she is misspeaking. So how do you get away with this? It would seem to be, having watched her a few times, she simply assumes you're either going to forget about this or you are a stupid person. Now, I want to tell you a Jewish idea, which I think is very exciting. I, heard the, I saw this in the Sefer by Rabbi Rucham, who was the Mashkiach of Mir. I could quote it to you inside, but we've got lots to get through, so let me just cut to the chase. At the end of the story of Genesis, it talks about, uh, sorry, end of, uh, the end of Noah, it talks about the birth of Avram Avinu. Who knows the name of Avram Avinu's father? Terah. Okay. It says that, that Terach was 70 years of age when Avram was born. And then it goes on to tell you that the family moved from a place called ur -Kastin, And they go to live in Israel. They set out to go to live in Israel, but they don't quite get there. They live in a place called Haran instead. And I'm afraid that's probably, uh, looking around here, something that might ring a bell with many of us. You planned to go to Israel, but somehow you, you didn't quite get there. In fact, I have a friend. He's a, he was a famous film star. He's now a rabbi, teaches in Yerushalayim. Um, but anyway, this famous film star who was in movies with Sigourney Weaver, Elizabeth Taylor, Walter Matthau, uh, he once told me an interesting thing. He was in a hotel in Florida. So basically, he was, he was sitting at a table, and there was a bunch of old guys sitting at a table next to him. And he was overhearing the conversation. And one guy says, I think I'm going to move to Israel. And his two friends said, that's a great idea. Yep, I think I'm going to move to Israel. Great. So why don't you? Yep, I'm going to move to Israel. So what are you waiting for? I'm waiting till it's too late. <laughs> I'm waiting till it's too late. that? Can't, doesn't that ring a bell? There's a certain sadness there. Sometimes we wait till it's too late and we never get to go. So what it says is they set out to go to Israel. They don't quite get to go there. And then it says, this is the end of the Seder of Noach, and Terach dies in this place called Haron. And his life was 205 years of age. And then God speaks to Avram, Lech lachom lachom Leave your father's land and go to the new place, which I'll tell you about. And Avram is 75 when he goes. Now, the strange thing is, the way the Torah writes it, it seems as though he only left his father after he died. It says that his father dies, he's 205, and then Avram goes to the land of Israel. But that can't possibly be true. Again, Avra, Terach was 70 when Avram was born. Avram was 75 when he went to Israel. Therefore, who's good at math? Right. And therefore, if it was 145, how many years did Avram leave his father alone? 60 years. So why does the Torah write it that assumes or lets you assume that Avram only left his father to go to Israel after Terach died? 
You go about the end of Sedra of Noach, Terach dies, it says, and then Avram goes to Israel. But he was still alive. He was still alive for 60 years. So the classic commentator, of course, is Rashi. And Rashi says, I'll tell you why it says it that way. Answer number one, from a Jewish point of view, a bad guy, an evil person, even during their lifetime, is considered dead. They've killed their spiritual potential, which is the main purpose of a human being, and therefore they're considered dead. And as Avram's father was a very nasty guy, he was dead. OK, so it's not really a lie. Answer number two, listen to this one. It writes it in that way to suggest that he only left his father after he died because people shouldn't, shouldn't know, people shouldn't see that he left his poor old dad alone for 60 years. Right? Because they'll say, ha, some frimmer, that Avram Avinu, he left his father for 60 years? What happened to keep it up the aim, honoring your mother and father? So in order that people shouldn't say that, the Torah writes it as though he only left his father after he died. Did you follow that with me? That's what Rashi says. Rabbi Rucham says, what nonsense is this? If Rashi is saying that the Torah is trying to camouflage, to disguise the fact that he left his father for 60 years, if he's trying to draw a veil over the fact, any kid can add 70 and 75, get to 145, subtract that from 205, and see that he left his father for 60 years. So what on earth is Rashi talking about? The Rabbi Rukum says something which is incredibly brilliant. So what Rashi's really telling is, if you want to draw a veil over the truth, it needs only be the thinnest of veils, because people don't look, people don't think. People don't look, people don't think, oh yes, they could add 70 and 75 and do that subtraction, but they won't. People don't look, people don't think. Isn't that sad? See, Hillary knows this. <laughs> Hillary knows that people don't look and people don't think, but it's true. The majority of people don't look and don't think. And if it says it in the TV, it's true. Um, I remember many years ago, I was living in Gateshead, I was in started Gateshead Yeshiva, and I was staying with a young couple who were friends of mine. Uh, we were about the same age, they were a little bit older than me, and uh, they were both Bali Teshuva. Uh, David came from Birmingham, Birmingham in England, and he came from a traditional Orthodox synagogue, not particularly religious, but Orthodox synagogue. His wife, she came from a Reformed family, and I was staying with them for a couple of weeks, and one night, they had to go and visit this lady's mother and dad. Now, her mother and father were both uh, doctors, both specialists. One was a gynecologist, and one, I can't remember, I think it was a brain surgeon. Clever people. So they said to me, did I want to come to meet her parents? And I said, sure. Now, you have to understand that the parents were having a tough time, right, with the fact that their daughter in a reform shul, was now married to an orthodox guy. That was tough. Not only is, she, is her daughter married to an orthodox guy, they're now bringing their ultra-orthodox Scottish friend with them as well. You could understand that it was, you know, challenging. And so I arrived, and uh, I was introduced to the mother and to the father, who were delightful people, incidentally. And we started to make small talk. And when I say small talk, I'm talking microscopically small talk. Because after all, what did we have in common? I'm studying to be an Orthodox rabbi, and she's a gynecologist. Well, I've never been pregnant. So I mean, what, what are we going to have in common? So then in a burst of inspiration, she then said, oh, there's a program that's starting on the other side in BBC, which you will enjoy. And the program was going through all the miracles that happened to the Jews in Egypt, showing them were that the fact that they were not really miracles at all, they were natural phenomena. So of, <laughs> so of course, as an Orthodox rabbinical student, I'd be interested in watching this. So she jumped up and changed the channel, and we watched the, the, the credits running down the screen. And eventually, when the credits had stopped, there was a desert, there was sand, 
there was noise of the wind and the sand. And the camera moved to the left, and the presenter of the program, who was a famous presenter in those days called Magnus Magnuson, is that a cool name? Magnus Magnuson is standing there, and he said, good evening. I can't remember the name of the program, whatever it was called. Um, Idiot's Half Hour, something like that. He said, uh, tonight on Idiot's Half Hour, we're going to be discussing the miracle that occurred to the Jews in their wandering in the desert over 40 years. And then he stops and the voice says, and the Jews had nothing to eat. And they called out to God. And God sent them manna from heaven. And then the guy starts up again. What was this manna? What was it really? Because, of course, it couldn't possibly be a miracle from heaven. So he starts to walk. And as he walks, the camera follows him. And then he comes to a place, and on the ground, there was a tumbleweed. A tumbleweed. You, ever, you know what a tumbleweed is? Seen it in the old cowboy movies? It's about the size of a basketball. It's, it looks like a, a ball of wool, really. It's actually a, a bush, which is blown along by the wind. So he stops, and he points at this, and he says, This is Elephantus non caput murum, better known as the lesser Bedouin tumbleweed. This has been scientifically analyzed and been found to contain vitamin D, vitamin B, and iron. And then he looked at the camera triumphantly. This, then, is the mysterious manna which sustained the Jewish people in their wanderings in the desert over 40 years. And I was sitting there, and I thought to myself, one tumbleweed? <laughs> one stinking tumbleweed? There were 600,000 male Jews, and they were married. So that's 1,200,000 1, people, and then the children. There's 3 million people. One tumbleweed and 3 million people. I imagined Moses with a surgical knife, cutting tiny slithers and telling the people, suck, don't chew. It's got to last you 40 years. I mean, the, in <laughs> but the intriguing thing was the reaction of my friend's parents, both doctors, both highly qualified, highly intelligent, sitting going, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because the TV had said that that was happening, and that was the truth, so it must be the truth. So Hillary knows that most people don't think, and most people don't look. So she just, when they show her the footage, when they show her the evidence that she said, uh, she says, and in hopes that you're going to forget about this when you go to your ballot. <laughs> then we have Donald. <laughs> Donald. Now, as I say, <laughs> it's difficult for me to criticize Donald because he's half Scottish. No, I'm completely Scottish. Um, all I can say about Donald is, wow. Wow. Um, Donald... <laughs> Again, from a Jewish point of view, again, they all have a point. Hillary has a point. Donald has a point. Um, I think the first point you should get is a proper hairdresser. And, and I have to tell you, because it's a Bakarian show, I mean, all my hairdressers are Bakarians. I mean, we could sort him out in two seconds in this congregation, could we not? Right? But anyway, apart from that, uh, economically, I'm not an economist. Incidentally, this is an important thing. What is the most important things you should be voting about when it comes to choosing a candidate for president? Well, the first thing they say is your basic criteria should be the security of the country. The first duty of a government is to protect its citizens. Okay? Anybody here ever been to West Point? Anybody here ever studied military strategy? No. Okay, good. Uh, me neither. Okay, next thing is the economy. The economy, stupid, as Bill Clinton used to say, okay? Anybody here a qualified economist? There you go. Now, so the two most important things that should be the reason why you're voting for any candidate is their qualification and looking after the security of the country and the economy. But I don't know. I personally don't know if they're qualified because I know nothing about economics and I know nothing about the military. So I suppose putting my little Lex is a bit of a joke. But leaving all that aside, I don't know if he is going to be good for the economy. I'm not sure if he's going to be good for the security. Maybe yes, maybe no. 
that from a Jewish point of view, is there any problems with him? There's certainly a problem from a Jewish point of view voting for somebody who lies consistently. From a Jewish point of view, there's also a problem voting for somebody who speaks so very crudely and badly, and particularly about women. Uh, now this, from a Jewish point of view, I, I brought along Rabbi Dessler, or in famous Mikta Melio. Rabbi Dessler talks about what's called Adinus Hadibur. There is a concept in Judaism about refinement of speech. Rabbi Dessler says, I'm not talking about swear words. And unfortunately today, all the worst words seem to become, you know, cheapened, common. Uh, but here he's talking about refined words. So here's the interesting thing. He says, there was the famous rabbi, Rabbi Hill, and there were two of the, his students in front of him. They were discussing the halacha, and the halacha says that when you are, let me read this a little bit to you, I'll read this in Hebrew just to show I'm a rabbi. This is from Gomorrah in Psochim. It says, It was three Two Talmudim sitting in front of Hilo. Chad Minayhu Rabban Yochanan ben Zakkai. And one of them was the famous Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai. Chad Omar Ein Masikin Betahara. One says, when it comes to the grapes, when it comes to crushing grapes to make wine, you have to be tohar, no contact with a dead body and all that sort of stuff. But when you're cutting olives to press olives for oil, it doesn't matter if you're, to if you're tohar or you're not tohar, pure or not pure. So Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai said, why is it when it comes to squishing grapes, you have to be toher, means pure. But when you're cutting olives, then it's okay if you're not pure. With me? The other rabbi said the same question. Why is it when you're squishing grapes, you have to be tar? And why is it when you're cutting olives, you can be tommy, which means impure? When Hillel heard that, he said, the first rabbi, Rabbi Yochum and Zakkai, I am sure he's going to become a great in the Jewish people. He avoided using the word Tommy. Now, Tommy means impure. But he didn't use a word which has got a negative connotation. And all we're talking, I mean, we're talking in halacha, and it's an accurate word. There's a certain Jewish idea that refinement of speech, if you're careful about how you speak, it reflects a certain refinement of the person inside, and if I'm really being religious, a refinement of the soul. What Donald Trump said to Megan Fox, Kelly. Oh, Megan Kelly, thank you, on Fox News, yes, thank you, Megan Kelly, I found so profoundly offensive, so upsetting, that I have to tell you, from a Jewish point of view, there's a worry. And then I mustn't forget the dear comrade Bernie. the dear leader who has brought socialism to the United States of America. Um, and he started off as a socialist, now he's a social democrat. Mm, the Yiddish word is a kvetch. It's a bit, you know, that's a bit of a kvetch, Bernie. Um, OK, now, does Ber again, does Bernie have a point? I believe Bernie has points. I believe Hillary's got points. I believe Donald's got points. From a Jewish point of view, from a Torah point of view, is there a problem with Bernie? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes, there's a problem, Bernie. Uh, first of all, maybe it's because you're Jewish and you're upset about a Jew who holds his views. Of course, from Bernie's point of view, he's not Jewish. He's Polish. Right? So Bernie, the first thing is that Bernie's been spending a lot of time ignoring or hiding or trying to cover the fact that he's Jewish. What's so wrong with being Jewish? Hands up here if you're ashamed of being Jewish. Oh, good. No one. Well, Bernie seems to be, he seems to be very prob a great big problem with being Jewish and a great big problem with the state of Israel and lots of big problems with everything that probably you think is a good thing. There is uh, an anti-religious Jewish newspaper in Israel. Actually, there's quite a few anti-religious Jewish newspapers in Israel. In fact, there's even an anti-Israel Jewish newspaper in Israel, which is uh, a funny thing. But anyway... Uh, when Bernie uh, was denying he was Jewish, I was reminded a little bit of a famous story that appeared in one of Israel's most famous anti-Israel newspapers. 
And it was 20 years ago. And it was amazing that this story appeared in this newspaper. It's two Israelis who are secular, a father and a son, a little boy and his daddy. And it was Hanukkah time. So the little boy says to the father, Abba, achashmonaim. Ayadatiim? Where are the Hashmonaim from? Where are the Hashmonaim religious? And his father says, Datiim! Umapitoma, Datiim, no, and no Datiim. In Chilonim, come on, no, we're just like us, you know, just totally, uh, you know, uh, non religious. So the little boy says to Daddy, But Daddy, they did seek the kosher oil with the seal of the Kohen Godel. So the father concedes that maybe they were a little bit religious. The little boy says to Daddy, Daddy, did they keep Shabbat? Did the Chashem and I keep Shabbat? Shabbat! Matel Mel! Shabbat! Shabbat! This little boy says, but you know, Daddy, they did. They did take all the Avodah Zarah out of the Beit HaMikdash that the Greeks had put there. So the Daddy concedes that mm, maybe indeed they were, uh, maybe they kept Shabbat. Daddy, did they keep Kashrut? Kashrut! But Daddy, they prayed in the Beit HaMikdash Maybe they kept ca- maybe they kept kashrut, ca- and then the little boy turns around to the father and says an incredibly interesting thing. Daddy, if we had lived then, on what side would we have fought? On what side would we have fought? And sadly, all the way through Jewish history, we're not comfortable about this. We don't like this, but I think we all know very clearly that there are many periods in Jewish history when our greatest enemies have attacked the Jewish people and found willing helpers amongst the Jewish people. It was certainly the case in the Hanukkah story, the civil war at Hanukkah, it was a civil war of Jew against Jew. Jews who wanted to be Greeks, who didn't want to be Jewish anymore. And then, of course, there was in the USSR, there was something called the Yevsexia. Anybody remember the Yevsexia? The Yevsexia was the Jewish section of the Communist Party. It was the Jewish Communists that gathered up the rabbis, gathered up the teachers from the Chedorim, sent them to Siberia, or shot them. And Stalin expressed his gratitude for the very capable and good job that the Yevsexia did by lining them up against a wall and machine gunning them. But all the way through Jewish history, sadly, there are all sorts of Jews who, for some reason or other, ally themselves to the enemies of the Jewish people. And in today's world, there's something called the BDS. Have you come across the BDS? The Boycott, Disinvest, an Israel movement, sanction movement. And they're full of Jews who are campaigning to have America and every country disinvest in Israel, not invest in Israel. Look upon Israel, pretend that Israel's like apartheid South Africa. So it's always a problem when a Jew is embarrassed to be a Jew and finds himself allying himself with the enemies of the Jewish people. And unfortunately, we've heard a lot of that from Comrade Bernie. So does he have a point? Yeah. But there's a big worry, particularly from a Jewish point of view, about him. But I have to tell you that in a country of 350 million people, which is the current population of the United States of America, isn't it astonishing that these are your three candidates? It's amazing. There (laughs) there There is a yard sign. You know people put yard signs? which say, you know, whoever it is, you know, Reagan or whatever, whoever you wanted to vote for, somebody's produced one. I won't quote it exactly, but it says, 2016, they're all rubbish. It uses a different phrase, right? But they're all garbage. And people are seriously frustrated. It, the Democrats are frustrated. A lot of people just don't want Hillary. Democrats don't want Hillary. A lot of Democrats don't want Bernie. <laughs> and a lot of Republicans don't want Donald, you know? So isn't that a strange moment in Jewish history, in American history, but certainly us? And interestingly, 
by the way, it is, I think if Hillary was to become the candidate, in all probability, I mean become the president, in all probability she'll be the last pro-Israel democratic president. And how pro-Israel she is, bearing in mind that she's allied with some unpleasant anti-Israel Jews, uh, I don't know. However, the left, the political left in the world, and I certainly see that in, in England, the head of the Labour Party, which is our Democratic Party, is a profoundly anti-Israel, strong anti-Semitic person called Jeremy Corbyn. So the political left that you were comfortable with, that you were brought up with if you're a Democrat, a registered Democrat, if you voted Democrat, and certainly my wife is American, a ton of her family are registered Democrats, that world and that democratic world and party that you knew is changing radically when it comes to Jews and moving in an extremely uncomfortable direction. So if Hillary gets it, I think I'm guessing she will probably be the last openly pro-Israel candidate. Um, because certainly the person she's taking over from ain't so pro-Israel, is he? So here we are from a Jewish point of view. And then we move, I think, to the, cl the real clincher, which is what I want to talk to you about tonight. And that is, don't think that the situation that we're in at the moment, when I think most of us agreed, and even my friend Khabib would agree, that we have not the best candidates. We could have perhaps have hoped for better candidates. No, I just agree with you. Okay, disagrees. Okay. Everybody except Khabib um, <laughs> agrees. Agree. <laughs> And of course, a great philosopher once said, if the whole world thinks one thing and you think the opposite, you have to at least be willing to consider the possibility that maybe you're wrong. It's a nice <laughs> idea for me. Anyway, but so if there were better candidates, mm, but most people are struggling with these candidates and thinking maybe they're not ideal, apart from Khabib. Um, uh, but basically, here's the issue. The issue is don't think when you get to a situation when leaders are, like the current president of the state of Israel, whom I think we'll agree, is not pro-Israel. <laughs> now he thinks whatever I say. Good. I say you give me all your money. Uh, right. So if you find yourself in a situation like that, the question is why? Why do we find ourselves in a situation when leaders, kings, presidents, queens, suddenly turn on the Jewish people? Are no longer friends of the Jewish people? And the answer, I think, is very simple. Rabbi Desto says, the Talmud says, there are no people who have less freedom of choice over their actions than rulers. Again, there are no people who have less choice over their actions than rulers. That means kings, presidents, prime ministers, and queens. Ultimately, they are not direct in their actions. Can you think of a story that maybe hints at this in the Torah? Pharaoh. Pharaoh. We've got a guy called Pharaoh. Moses comes to Pharaoh, and God says to him, just tell him the God of the Hebrews says to let my people go. And Pharaoh says, who? The God of the Hebrews. He gets down the Guinness Book of World Gods. He goes through it, can't find him, never heard of him, which is a complete lie, bearing in mind just one generation before. The entire country was saved by a Jew called Joseph. Even if you're from a different generation and you, when you were born, Kennedy had been killed, you know there was a president called Kennedy, no? If you were British, you've heard of a prime minister called Winston Churchill. And if you're Egyptian, you've heard of a viceroy of Egypt called Joseph, who was a Jew and who saved your entire economy and your entire people. I never heard of him. So then... God told Moses, throw down your stick and turn it into a snake. Boom. Pharaoh's reaction, magicians do the same thing. And they did. Then the Medrash says, he said to his wife, you do it. She threw down her stick and it turns into a snake. Then he then said to the teenage boys who were watching this going on, you do it. And they turned them into snakes. And then they brought the children from the kindergarten. And they could turn sticks into snakes. It was a society built on occult power. It was a bit like Hogwarts, right? all full of magic. But then, eventually, there is the next plague, which is Dam, then Svardea, etc., etc. But the strange thing is the reaction of the Egyptians. 
So if you were, let's go back in time. Let's imagine we're there. We're back in time, and what happens is you see the first miracle. OK, maybe you've been watching the BBC and this program and manna from heaven, uh, and then the next, and then the next miracle, and the next miracle. But you watch miracle after miracle. And after seven miracles, what's Pharaoh's perspective? What does he say now? It's God. I'm sorry. We made a mistake. And then God says to him, in the beginning of Parshas, Bo says to Moses, Bo el paro. The Yom Hashem Moshe, Bo el paro, come to paro. Ki ani hichbadete et libo. Because I've hardened his heart. Ve'et le, et in the heart of his servants. Lamanchiti otata ele bekebo. In order to put these signs inside of him. Now, every kid will tell you, that the previous Sedra of the era has how many miracles in it? Seven. It's got a Vav, Vav, and Aleph, seven. And Ba is base and Aleph. That's three. So you get seven of the, of the, of the uh, Makot in the first and three in the next. And God says, go to Pharaoh. I'm going to put these signs in his heart. These signs? What signs? Not the ones that are coming, because they've not been here already. It's the ones that already have taken place. I know he said he's sorry. But how many times in life have you come across somebody who said they're sorry, but they don't mean it. They just do it with their lips. It's going to need more of the medication, more of the treatment, before he actually gets it and takes this seriously. So I've hardened his heart. Ah, so did God take away his freedom of choice or not? Yes, he did. But you know what? No, he didn't. Well, this is a Jewish answer. Listen to this. This is brilliant. This is the Ramban. The Ramban says, what did God do when he hardened his heart? No, he took away his choice. He gave him it back again. Because when you see a miracle after a miracle, I mean, what would you do? Suppose you are an Egyptian charioteer. There are three guys in each chariot. A captain, the guy who's doing the horses, and the guy who's loading your bow and arrow. And you're just about to get the Jews. When suddenly the sea goes, boop, and according to one opinion, boop, 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 12 different pathways for 12 different tribes. And the seabed comes up to meet the Jews. And from the, the columns of salt water, out comes spring water for them to drink. Now suppose you're chasing after them. What would you do next? Even if you haven't seen the movie or read the book, what do you think is coming next? I think I could have worked this one out. If I was in charge of the chariot, I would say, Muhammad, stop. St turn around. Slow I'm going down the bar. I know what's coming next. I'm out of here. <laughs> but instead, what do they do? Straight in. And it's glug, 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 yiskadal, yiskadash. Right? This is astonishing. So God takes away their freedom of choice. But you know how he does it? It's incredible. By giving that back again. What was the position of the Egyptians when Pharaoh, when Moses comes to him and says, let my people go. He says, get lost. But then you get miracle after miracle after miracle. That takes away your freedom of choice. So now, of course, he's going to let the people go because he's got no choice. God gives them, takes away the effects that the miracles have had on him to put him back to where he was at the beginning without the miracles. He goes back to being the guy he was before. And what, was the, what did the guy before say? Get lost. He says, get lost again. I'm not letting you go. You got that? God takes away the choice of the big guys in order to end up with the end of the story that he wants to be the end of the story. And we, if we're very clever, should notice that when the great leaders of the world turn on the Jewish people, or uh, turn their back on the Jewish people. They turn on us, or they turn their back on us. You can either be very foolish and think it's them, or if you've got a Jewish perspective, you'll know it's not them. We are getting a message, Min HaShemayim. Hashem sending us a message here. When you've got a nuclear deal, like Barack Obama signed with Iran, which not only in a few years' time will allow them to have nuclear weapons, also allows them to have intercontinental ballistic missiles. You know, 
missiles with the range to hit the United States of America with nuclear warheads. Now, when that sort of thing happens, and as we saw recently, if you keep up with the news, that this was all spun. This deal was done long before they told the, the American people they were negotiating. No, they weren't negotiating. It was a done deal. They had capitulated. It was one of the most stupid diplomatic deals in human history. And you think to yourself, that Obama guy hates Israel. Well, if you want to look at it like that, that's fair enough. But the rabbis say that the greatest leaders of the world are only puppets, and he's pulling the strings. It's a message being sent to the Jewish people. What the message is? Well, first of all, don't trust human beings. There's a wonderful sefer called Chobos Salavomer, one of the great Sephardi classics. In it, there's a chapter called Shar and I just translated this, my new book. I didn't bring any. Uh, but you'll get them in the stores if you want. I called it Refu Salev. Refus Alev means to cure the heart. Because if you get the right perspective in your relationship and your knowledge of your, the interaction between God and the Jewish people, then that cures all the pain that you've got. And in it he says, you can never really trust anybody except God. You know what? I think what he means like this. Of course you can try. If you came and asked me for help, I think I can promise you, you would, I would try and give you help. You can trust someone, but you can't put your trust in someone. Because people let you down. They might not mean to. You want to borrow money from me, and I want to lend you the money, but you know what? My accountant phoned me earlier today, and he says that the money you thought you had, Rubenstein, you don't have. Or it could be that I want to give you the money, and I do have the money, but when I get home, my wife says no. And that's probably... Uh, um, or it could be that, you know, guess what? I break my leg, and I'm not well, or something like that. You can trust people, but you can't put your trust in people. The only person, the only one we can really trust is Hashem. And every single person, every single time the Jewish people put their trust in someone or somebody else, here's what it says in that book. If you put your trust in somebody, let's say, 50%, you trust God 50%, and the White House another 50%, God removes his shmirah, his control, his protection of you, relative to the amount of trust you put in somebody else. You want to trust them, then trust them. Why didn't, the, why didn't the, the Allies bomb Auschwitz? There are books called Why Didn't the Allies Bomb Auschwitz? Well, there was plans smuggled out. The Allies, America, Russia, and Britain knew exactly what was happening in Auschwitz. The Americans replied and said, the reason is because that area of the war, war is under British control. The Russians didn't even reply. And the British replied and said, we are conducting the war in a strategic and not on a humanitarian basis. They could have bombed the railway lines. When, incidentally, the British discovered that Auschwitz also had an armaments factory in it, the RAF did bomb Auschwitz. But just with great precision, the armaments factory. But not the gas chambers. Not the railway lines. Because they really didn't care. After the Second World War, are you going to trust the Allies? Didn't work out for us that time. Are we really going to trust Barack Obama? I think not. And if you find that the candidates who are going to occupy the most powerful office in the world are frankly less than ideal, to the point where there are yard signs saying they're all garbage, then you've got to say to yourself, what is the message from there? Maybe there's a little nudge in the ribs coming from Shemaim to say, maybe it's time you got it right. Stop trusting people who will let you down. I'm not making them let you down. They'll let you down. Maybe instead, you should trust me. Any questions? Lady here. Gentlemen there. Yes, ladies first. Um, if this, if, you know, I agree that the, uh, the vote candidates are horrible. I mean, I'm going to vote for Trump just because... Khabib, she's voting for Trump. Supreme Court nominees and Israel and the Iran deal. Those are my three reasons, but I think he's a pig. But um, <laughs> aside from that, if, if Hashem is giving us this message, you know, I'm going to really stick it, stick it to you and show you by, by having these horrible candidates emerge that you can't trust in them, but you trust in me. 
Do you think this could maybe be like a payback for all of this like gay marriage and transgenderism? Really like us going off the rails? I don't think so. I think it's a general... Look, I'm not a prophet. I'm only... Here's the deal. If we had prophets, a prophet could tell you this is why this is all happening and off into place. I'm not a prophet. Generally, when things go wrong, as the Talmud says in Brochus, you flash fish from myself, you certainly look to see if you did anything wrong. That's fair enough. As, as a human race, uh, as an American, you're doing... 100%. And again, interestingly, the Kabbalist of Lubavitch says, beautiful, it's become one of my very favorite stories. He says, all the way through history, there are certain countries that have been specially blessed by God. Specially blessed by God. And because they've been given spe a special place in the world, that requires from them a special commitment to God. And maybe, it's very interesting, if you read any of the two autobiographies of Barack Obama, then he makes it quite clear that his policy is that America should withdraw from being the leader of the world. And that other people take, I mean, that's, that's not in dispute, right? It's interesting that you have, we have a president who feels that America's great days, leadership days, should be diminished and other people should take over. And it's interesting that that seems to be happening in America, but at the same time, uh, the moral commitment of this, which was a very religious country up until not too long ago, I'm not talking about us, I'm talking about the whole country, has diminished as well. I'm just wondering if perhaps there's a correlation between the two. Well, but, but all three are related, like the movement. I agree. Theism, gay marriage, I, I, all related, they're all one. Yeah, but there's, a lot, but there's a lot more. I was horrified to see a statistic... Um, and I have to tell you, moving here, I've been, there's a lot of, a lot of surprises moving as a new guy to America, um, which I've seen, which I'm really quite shocked. Um, there's something called the, um, the Van Wyck Expressway. Um, I find... <laughs> I find this shocking. Um, there is, it's not an expressway, and it's because there is work going on there. No, there's not! I've never seen anybody working on the Van Wyck Expressway. All I've seen is being blocked all the time. But quite seriously, there's another thing, uh, and that is that um, there was a survey recently that found that half of all Americans, if they had to find $400 for an emergency thing, would find it difficult to find $400. Because the world thinks of America as being the gold in the Medina. Another statistic I heard was $1,000. It made more sense to me. But apparently, I just saw it in, in the Atlantic magazine recently that $400 for a lot of people, if they had to find $400 tomorrow, half of Americans, it said, would be struggling with this. Wow. What happened to the land, you know, where everybody was going to become rich and, and all that sort of stuff? The poverty that I've seen, and even amongst the Jewish people, of course, we're all protected because the Sadaka Jews will always look after other Jews, etc. But I don't know how other communities get by. Because there's so much shocking poverty here. Bernie has a point. Right? The Democrats have a point. Everybody's got a point. Right? But it's, you know, the greatness of the country sometimes is in its past when it could be in its future. And according to the Chobos of Babas, the greatness that I give you depends on what you give back to me. So when the country just throws God under the, under the bus, as they say, which it seems to have done to a large degree, and not just in these issues, maybe the fact that we're, you know, we're not looking after other Americans as well as we should, other human beings as well as we should, maybe that's also part of the mix. I don't know. I'll have to discuss this with the Almighty next time I'm davening. <laughs> Sir? Rabbi, um, just to uh, answer something you just mentioned about uh, poverty in the United States. Yes. Um, I know you mean well. But uh, you really have to take into account, uh, starting with uh, LBJ in the early 60s, uh, they have something called the uh, War on Poverty. Yeah. They have spent, the Democrats basically have spent trillions of dollars on, on poverty programs, and they have gotten basically not past square one. They have not yeah. at all. This is the Did you hear what the gentleman was saying? He was going back to, the, to LBJ's War on Poverty, and he's saying, that in particular the Democratic Party has spent billions trying to alleviate poverty in America, and it's not been a success. It hasn't worked for whatever reason. I want to ask you, I caught the end of Donald Trump's speech a couple of days ago, and he was talking about a three-inch fish, and do you know what he was referring to? 
beats me. <laughs> no. Thank you very much. I think I better get out before I'm lynched. <laughs>